Hello, I'm Kristen Miller-Zone, Curator of Collections and Exhibitions at the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art, and I am thrilled today to introduce Kristen Tordella williams who has done the installation called Home Work that's currently on display at the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art. Okay, so hi, um, thank you everyone for being here, and thank you to the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art uh, for hosting my exhibition. I'm just really grateful for this opportunity. It's been a really wonderful journey. So. I grew up in Massachusetts. I went to school for art, and after I got my master's degree from Alfred University, I bounced around a little bit doing a little teaching, and I um, got a position at Millsaps College as a professor of art, and that's why I moved to Jackson, Mississippi about eight years ago. It's really hard to believe it was eight years ago. And um, since then, I've made a home there, and I make different kinds of artwork. Um, I call myself a conceptual artisan, which means that material and process are um, as important as the idea that drives the final form. So I'm very interested in ephemeral works as well as works that challenge our pre-held conceptions of um, our culture and our history. I was looking for an artist to do a project for the museum where the artist would select works from our collection and install them with works of their own, either that they had already created or that they created for the show. So tell us a little bit about going through the vaults and what you thought when you saw what we have in storage. Well, that was a really tumultuous visit. While I was introduced to this topic, the pandemic really hit. And I'm very grateful to have this to focus on. Uh, for about nine months of uh, 2020, I was working on this show. And I was interested in the collection of the museum as well as like the wealth that founded the museum, which for me is more than just the timber barons that really influenced the history of Laurel and impacted its future. It was also all of the workers and the natural resources of this area um, that, that led to the institution having the wealth that made it possible for me to have this exhibit. So I didn't come up with that when I first started this project. What I did do was a lot of research. And so I went away from this meeting with a whole pile of books from the gift shop. And I did a ton of reading about Laurel. And I was lucky enough to be introduced to Cleveland Payne. And I had some conversations with him over the phone and in person. Uh, as a local historian, he was super, super critical in helping me understand the diverse histories of Laurel. And then um, when I came back in the summer, I, I was like, Kristen, can I please be alone in the vault? You know, can I just look at these things? Because it's hard to, to like look and absorb um, artwork when you're kind of feeling like under the gun or or like yeah. So I pulled out in the in the vault. It was such a great opportunity. Like how lucky am I as like a super nerd um, art nerd to be able to pull out all of the collection and like look at all these different images. And I took a lot of photos on my phone. Another thing that I did at that time was look through a lot of the photo archives that they have here at the museum, this extensive history of the laborers in Laurel, as well as just the town and its changing um, landscape over time. And some of these things started to bubble up. So I was just basically putting a lot of input in my brain and I didn't have a total plan probably until August of 2020. Um, and I, I, when I came my first time, I think I had this idea of like the burnt books coming into play and I was like, I think I want to bring these burnt books in, but I wasn't totally sure how. I had made these before, and I, I, I wanted to have a mass of burnt books, and to really have something that's really ephemeral alongside something that has been protected by the institution's collection. So there was that urge, but the other works in the show, I don't think we were really conceptualized until I had done a lot of this research. When we went into the vault, there were hundreds of things that you were interested in possibly Ooh, showing. I'm like a little pro. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> we have such great works in the yes, collection. Yeah. You know, only a fraction of which we can never show. That's very typical for a museum. So, and there were some things that I was like, very interested in, like the silver and the basketry, but I wasn't interested in the requirements for showing them, which is like, so the silver, I didn't realize, would be tarnished if you left it out in the air and it has to have this like enclosure. And I was like, I visually, I wasn't in interested in that. And like the baskets, like how do you present them in a way that's protecting them from viewers um, according to the rules of the institution? And, and so there's some things that I couldn't include that I was very interested in from the collection. And so to that point, the, yeah. what you're seeing on the walls here are all works behind glass because when we realized that the books were going to be installed amongst them, we needed to make sure that any off-gassing 
of the chemicals from the books that were burned or the carbon that was now in the burnt books wouldn't affect the works themselves, the, the artworks themselves. And so we, we asked Kristen to choose works that were behind glass, which for the most part means it's works on paper, mm -hmm. which we don't have out all of the time because they fade in the light and so they have to rest quite a bit. And so this is probably one of the largest installations of our works on paper that we've had in a while. That's so really cool. I didn't know that. opportunity for people to see what we have in the vaults a lot of the time. Yeah, I, I was pushing for these books to be shown. I definitely, that was a big goal of mine. And they're, they're really symbolic of uh, inadequate history, right? And, and like a very beautiful object as well as something that is a product of violence, right? That, burn, that burning. And then talks about uh, historical things from Laurel, like the fires that were in the sawmills and uh, like little tidbits of histories that I found in my research. like the workers in Laurel, they own their own tools. And so if there was a fire in the sawmill and their tools burned, nobody was gonna replace them. So I found that as a fellow like laborer, like in my artwork, I think a lot about those traces of labor through time and in my own work is a product of that labor. Um, I, I just kind of felt um, an affinity towards that history. And so to place the burnt books amongst these objects is to kind of you know, use our word, juxtapose them with an alternative idea, right? To, of something that's not going to last. Like none of these books are going to last longer than this exhibition because you can't remake them. And so in December, the last time I was able to come before the exhibition was installed, I burnt 40 of these books outside um, near the pottery barn and then let them air out. They were books that were already destined for the trash. They weren't books that anybody was reading. They're reference books that I intercepted before they were thrown out from the Millsaps Library when they were doing kind of like a purge of old reference materials. So there's different things like, um, there's actually some art journals, like just bound copies of things that are all archived online now. And uh, like Shakespeare quarterlies and then other weird books that uh, nobody was reading, nobody was gonna use. And now that information is stored online, which again, the books kind of reference that, like they're no longer useful for what they were intended for originally. So the exhibition is called Home Work, and this and there are two galleries, and this is the home section yes. of the of the exhibition. And so we we've, we've hung the works kind of in salon style, or how people hang works on their walls at home. So that's one way that it's more home like. But then also the images that you chose have a lot to do with home. I didn't do a lot of research into each of these individual works. I looked at them all, and I I saw I saw a thread. And in the collection on these works on paper that were behind glass, right, so that was my framework, um, there were lots of images of the landscape. And a lot of Mississippi artists paint or depict the landscape, like I'm standing in front of a donut piece that is of, you know, a home in the environment around it. And like you can see like little silos and things like that in the work. And so many of the pieces are of um, the land, like trees or houses or homes or outbuildings and things like that. And then the other element that I was interested in, well, I guess there's two other elements. Um, the workers, right? So there's some images you can look around and tie them to workers and um, kind of like work life. Another thread would be um, domestic lives. And, and as well as showing like the diversity of the collection, like there's a lot of oddities in the collection, dare I say, like these images, there's multiple prints, um, Japanese woodblock prints of um, these woodworkers in Japan, you know, cutting, wood and that relates to the timber past of laurel but also i found them really odd and beautiful images who collected those and it turns out it was um it was wallace b rogers and he had a whole interest in collecting japanese woodblock prints so again it reflects a taste of the institution and how it changes over time because like there's also some other pieces by like deben corn or philip gustin that are well-known contemporary artists and that that just shows like the variety of the habits of the collectors of the museum um, and, and I wanted to show the diversity of people that live in Mississippi. So trying to make sure that, I, that a lot of different people were represented, um, men, women, black, white, you know, laborers, domestic lives. And so it was a really great opportunity to have a salon style hang because then I don't have to be too choosy about what I'm pulling from that, uh, the collection. So we've come to the work side of the gallery. Can you give us an overview of the space? Yeah, so I was very interested, again, like I talked about earlier, the natural resources and the laborers who worked in the sawmills and out on the railroad in 
um, in Laurel and the surrounding areas. So on this side of the room, the natural resources are depicted in terms of like insects encapsulated in uh, industrial, it's called industrial amber. So it's an industrial version of um, this geological time, right, representing that time stretched out, as well as talking about, um, you know, the pustules that come out of pine trees. So the southern yellow pine is really what fueled the timber industry in Laurel. It was that big natural resource that these progressive, you know, Yankee <laughs> timber barons were looking for. They had cut out the woods in New England and in Wisconsin and things, and they were looking for more wood to cut down. And so, you know, if you've ever climbed a pine tree, you've seen those little bits of sap. And I, you know, I'm a fan of Jurassic Park. Of course, it's a huge reference for this image, but to make these almost like falsely in, um, in, in epoxy, it's a two-part epoxy blend that's been tinted with amber pigment. So I'm making kind of like this false idea of this encapsulated time, but at the same, at the same time, these will last a really long time. Um, and they are an, a product of industry and industrial, um, the industrial world on our environment that we're seeing today in terms of climate change. So these bugs, there's a diversity of bugs that I've gathered from my home and then I also bartered for um, and a different project of mine. So some of the more unique bugs are from that barter, but a lot of them are just from my house in Jackson. So you can see a fair amount of cockroaches, <laughs> bees, uh, there's a little desiccated like gecko here, a ladybug, a fly, and maybe some wasps. And so through the material, they're they're transformed into something really, really gorgeous and glowing. And so aesthetically, they're very attractive, but then they also represent um, the biodiversity that we're, we're kind of losing through climate change. And in pandemic times, little bubbles, right? Where they could represent um, each of us as we're encapsulated and cut off from one another Yeah, right now, in a certain sense, physically. I would say. You have installed these amber encapsulated bugs between two works by Betsy Eby. They are encaustic paintings. Do you mm -hmm. want to tell us why you chose them and how you installed them this way? Yeah, so these pieces, I, I was immediately struck by them when I looked through the collection and I think the collection has more realistic images, I would say, on, on the whole than abstract works. But these, these stood out not only for their scale, but for the imagery within them and how she created them within caustic. So the material is also a lot different from a lot of the other works in the collection. And then when you look at them, they almost look like a mass of swallows flowing through the air or, or leaves flying in the breeze. And so they have this really beautiful um, organic element to them. And out of the works in the collection, I felt like these fit really nicely with the other pieces that I had um, created for the show. And I, I don't know, I get an image in my head and I, I was like, these fit perfectly. They, they just have that beautiful um, organic look to them. Um, and I think they look awesome. I'm really grateful to Betsy for agreeing to split them. Betsy gave them to us as a diptych. And we asked her if we could split them apart for the show and she agreed. So this piece is called 40 Stumps. In my work, I use 40 a lot as a number. It's kind of like my number. So there's 40 pieces of the amber here. And the 40 references like the 40 hours of work week, but it also has like biblical connections. And when you start really thinking, thinking in the in a number, you start to see it everywhere. So it's just really become a number that unifies a lot of my different works that are multiples. So with this piece, I was looking through the archival photos and I saw all of these images of stumps. And in the town, you know, like they cut down, they clear cut pretty much all of the timber here, all that old world timber. Um, and then replant. So all the trees here were replanted after pretty much everything was cut down. And they, like in one of the prints over here, there's like a stump removal group, right? And if you look at a lot of those archival images, there's just like a sea of stumps, and then there'll be like a house or like the railroad, and then the, and then there'll be like a whole pile of logs on the railroad. So I was interested in, again in that um, impact on the natural resources of the the boards. Um, I was interested in the impact of industry on the landscape. And these now have become a ghost forest. So they're, it's like they're alive with the lights. Um, these are all custom wired LEDs. They, that come on and off using a pretty, pretty low tech solution of Christmas tree light timers. And they, they, they come alive, right? It's like a chorus of um, cicadas, which again are represented in the industrial amber piece. They're, they're like uh, fireflies 
in the woods, if you ever have been lucky enough to, to be around a bunch of lightning bugs and they are flashing all at the same time, it's just like a miraculous moment. But all of this work here in the gallery is made of materials that were maybe have an industrial origin like the chicken wire. Here, that, that definitely was produced in a factory somewhere. And then the, they had like some, they had a lot of process even in their histories before they came to my studio. Um, the wood chips that are on the ground serve a twofold purpose. One is one of which is to hide the electrical cords, and then the other is to create kind of like a blanket or bed, like you would see in the forest. And originally, I wanted to have like pine needles and other like bark and things that you see in the pine forests around Laurel, but they would maybe have bugs in them, and those bugs are not good for museums, and they are very bad. And so, <laughs> and so we compromised and. Um, I can't remember who came up with the solution. It's a great solution. These are wood, like bedding for um, horses or rabbits, and you can buy it here for a very affordable price in Laurel, and it's American made, and they're pine shavings, and so it actually ended up being really perfect for the piece itself. They have this beautiful texture, this soft bed around the stump forms, and so the, the uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about how it actually turned out with the pillowy things. But the stumps themselves, I'm a paper maker, and so the stumps were created from sculpted chicken mesh, and they took a fair amount of time. If you see this mesh here, it's all been sculpted by my hands with uh, needle nose pliers and wire, wire cutters. And the, after they were sculpted into the stump form, I took this, this wire mesh, and because I have this knowledge as a paper maker, I dipped it into a vat of beaten kozo fiber, and then also into a grass pulp that I had uh, grown in my own backyard and processed myself, kind of through another laborious process. But fortunately, I had a whole bunch of that in the freezer, so that was already made. So the kozo I sourced from Carriage House paper, and it's from Thailand. So again, there's this interesting interplay of materials the kozo comes from the bark of a mulberry tree and it's grown in Thailand for paper makers and processed for paper makers. And um, I use that in combination with a, a bunch of other materials to create these forms. So the prints are printed on the same paper. They're actually, so instead of having two separate vats, so in the paper studio you would have like a vat of pulp suspended in water. Um, for the stumps I had two separate vats. For these I mix the kozo with the grass uh, to create a really unique blend. It has a little bit of a green tinge. I think it's kind of hard to see. Um, it also makes like kind of a crinkly paper. And I made all of these, they're 15, or they're 16 by 20 inches. Um, so it's a nice size uh, paper for me. It's a, a bit larger than I have been able to make in the past. And um, they're very thin, like a thin sheet of paper. So when I printed them, the wood block created like an indention in the paper that I didn't totally love, so I tried to, I like crumpled it up. <laughs> I crumpled them up and I unfolded them and kind of flattened them and then it showed, again, that idea of age or of time or wrinkling that I think is really attractive. Although when you photograph them, it becomes difficult to see some of the details that you can see with the eye. The nails themselves, I pulled out of uh, hemlock boards. Me and my husband had sourced these old barn hemlock, actually in New York State, back when we lived up there. and. I kept all the nails, so they're really beautiful, and you don't really find nails like these anymore, and they have a lot of great history. So they're from a barn, you know, old barn wood. Um, and then the wood blocks, so these are wood block prints that I created the images as negatives in Photoshop. And then the images are all taken from the archives. Um, thank you, Tommy Rogers. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, sending me all these high quality, beautiful images. And then they're laser etched into a piece of wood, and that piece of wood came from a another another source in Jackson, um, Old House Depot. They they're um, a salvage, an architectural salvage company. And I was like, I went there, and I was like, um, do you have any pine? You know, do you have any wide pieces of pine? Which is, you know, of course, going to be more expensive because wider is older anyway. He he heard what I was looking for, and he pointed me to this pile of wood. And the trees, the wood here on all of these wood blocks came from a house in Macon, Mississippi that was built in about, I want to say 1906, but before you really could move materials without, um, with, with a car, right? So it was built in the middle of nowhere and they used like wagons, just like 
Um, you can see here like the oxen, this is of a hotel in Laurel, downtown Laurel, the Laurel Hotel, and then the oxen, right? So like the wood itself holds that history. And I'm very interested in the wood grain kind of coming forward through the image and doing something unpredictable, right? So I have this perfect image in Photoshop and I have the, I also have brought in scans of that research that I was doing from all those books. So this, this is actually referencing an alligator that lived in the town mill pond. And, and they brought this alligator up. One of the mill workers brought the alligator and lived there and it became this oddity that people would go and watch. It's just like this really unique story. Um, and there's just text that, you know, it's really more like found poetry than it's supposed to be a literal history because I'm not a historian, um, but I find history very inspiring. So I wanted to have those histories present and, you know, including histories that aren't something that we should really be proud of. Like in this one, this is the stump removal crew here and then like um, a sawmill group of workers, but the text is about um, the Choctaw removal. So thousands more were abandoned along with other possessions. When the majority of Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee Creek and Seminole families were marched under armed guard from their homes and farms to their new territories in Oklahoma during the Indian removal era. And, you know, there's a whole group of people who were in charge of this land before um, it was plundered for its goods, <laughs> you know, to, to talk about, um, to talk about that, I think is really important and to not, to not hide it and just be, try to be um, conscious of, of that history, like the Choctaw um, people who were here stewarding this land and then forcibly removed through our bureaucracy. Yeah, it's a sad, sad but necessary story to talk about. One final aspect of the exhibition is a website that Kristen had developed called the Laurel Living Archive and we would like people to contribute to it. So Kristen, will you tell us how it works? Yes, so I'm also interested in, in the audience being able to interact with our work and that was a big challenge in COVID times. And so I figured a website was a touch-free way of people being able to contribute to this idea of archive, of collection, and to talk about how the pandemic has disrupted your home and working lives. So whatever imagery you have of, of this moment, I think it's a really important moment and we're about to be on the other end of it, right? Where, where we're gonna wanna forget about all of this disruption, all of this pain and trauma and challenge. But I think that these domestic photos of everyday life um, where our working lives are intermeshed with our home lives, including like our school study spaces, our, our laptop setups, our, um, our ways of communicating, have all been disrupted by the pandemic. And so what can we do to represent and document that? And that's why I created this website. So all of the images and videos, you can do like a YouTube link, you could do um, a little bit of text, you could send, just upload a photo, um, and, and then it becomes like an archive time-wise of different, different elements. Whatever ways that you can picture this moment, I would love and welcome your submissions to the Laurel Living Archive. So you just go to laurellivingarchive.cloud to submit your pieces. And then you'll have to create a little login. Uh, it's all free. And then you can upload your content there. So what does your life look like? And how have you documented your lives in 2020? I would really appreciate your contributions. Open to everyone. Home work is on display at the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art through April 25th, 2021. We hope you'll be able to see it during the run of the show. And I want to thank Kristen for doing this gallery walk today because even after the show closes, people will be able to experience the work for time immemorial. So thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, aren't we the best, Kristen? <laughs> uh, I'm so grateful again for this opportunity and I just want to extend my deepest gratitude to the museum staff because I definitely wasn't, um, I think the joke would be like, I like, I don't like working with living artists. They change their minds, you know? I, I definitely appreciate all of the work that was put in through through the um, length of this installation. And because it didn't, it wasn't just the moment of me arriving at the museum. I just truly um, appreciate all the time and effort that was put forth um, from, from the staff, from Kristen. You know, um, I wouldn't have been able to do it without your guidance and assistance. So thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for helping us see the works in our collection in a new light and the history of Laurel in a new light. Thank you very much. Thanks, it was so fun, so fun. You can find out more about the museum's exhibitions at www.lrma.org.